Well, we're looking at this letter that the, again, the Apostle Paul wrote to this young, thriving church in Thessalonica. And as he's writing it, I don't know if you caught it, he's, he's expressing gratitude for the grace of God working in and through their life. So Paul's very excited, but then he does something interesting. I don't know if you noticed. As he's celebrating them, he stops and goes, hey, but I just need to let you guys know something. I've been out here in the streets and y'all are blowing up. You've got what every social media influencer and every aspiring politician longs to have. You got buzz. You have gone viral. People know your name. You're blowing up the algorithm. Word has gotten out. Did you notice that? He said, the word of God has sounded forth. That's a word for like a trumpet blast. North, south, east, west. They stood at the crossroads of the Roman Empire. And he says, word about what God is doing in your church has exploded all over the region. He said, it's crazy. Everywhere. Massive positive engagement. And then I love it. He says, it's gotten to the point, notice in verse eight, he says, not only has the word of the Lord sounded forth from you in Macedonia and Achaia, that's your region and surrounding areas. He said, your faith in God has gone forth everywhere so that we need not say anything for they themselves report concerning us, the kind of reception we had among you. He said, it's gotten to the point that when I travel to another city, before I can tell them about what God's doing in Thessalonica, they start telling me, oh my gosh, dude, you're not going to believe this. You showed up in Thessalonica and you preached and people believed and a church blew up. And Paul's like, yeah, I know. Where are you I was there. Why are you telling me this? He's like, we can't show up anywhere. They start telling us what happened when we went to you. He said, it's crazy the way you are blowing up around this town, which leads to a natural question. Why are they so excited? Not every church gets a letter like this where suddenly it's like, dude, everyone's talking about y'all. It's crazy. What happened in Thessalonica that was so significant? Because here's the thing. People talk about what they value. They talk about things that are interesting to them, right? Uh, like I remember when I was in middle school, I was in history class and a little group of four of us decided, let's, let's do a little experiment to see how fast rumors travel in a middle school. We were just curious, how would this happen, all right? And so we had a th hypothesis, let's test the theory. And so they decided, let's tell people that you, Ben, are now dating this girl here, right? We didn't use the word dating at that time. I think in middle school, we called it going with each other. Let's just, let's just tell people y'all are going with each other and see how long it takes to spread around the school. Sick irony of it was, I kind of had a crush on that girl, so this big joke was a little painful for me. But you know what? <laughs> I'm fine. I'm more than fine. I have a great life, okay? And, uh, but I agreed to this little experiment. And remember, we walked out of that room and I walked from my classroom directly to the lunchroom. It takes less than two minutes. And by the time I got to the lunchroom, the entire school knew. I mean, it took over the lunchroom. Everyone was talking about, oh my God, oh, all right, because that is so exciting in middle schools. And everywhere, uh, you know, uh, millennials, even our guys, it's just amazing. It's amazing. Who's dating who is very exciting. And uh, that's a subject that you're going to talk about if it's interesting to you. And here, people are talking about Thessalonica. Something happened here that's blowing people's minds. And notice what he says. What is it? They report to us concerning the kind of reception we had among you, how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God. That's what blew their mind. You turned to God from idols. Can you believe it? Thessalonians turned from idols. Isn't that crazy? I can tell you're a little underwhelmed, Washington, D.C. Because <laughs> we don't really understand the significance of it. Some of us, if we're honest, we're like, yeah, I never really got that. Like all through the Bible, they're into idols. They're worshiping these little statues and it's a big issue all through the Bible. Like I don't understand the draw to these little statues. What's going on with that? So you don't really see the significance of why that was such a big deal, which is understandable. But you got to understand that idols back then weren't just like pieces of wood or metal that you would bow to or offer grain to. They were the structures around which the society was built. And so idols would, would structure not just your personal life, but your social life and your political life. I mean, we've got um, writings from Thessalonica, ancient manuscripts that talk about well over 20 plus deities in Thessalonica. It was a town filled with idols. And, and the way you would operate with idols is you would go to them and bring an offering because you wanted that God to get something for you. It's very transactional. So we've got writings of, of prayers to Artemis where they asked Artemis, dispatch this sickness for I am offering you a mountain roaming boar. 
Or there's a, a prayer recorded to Apollo that says, Apollo, be gracious to me and give my sales favorable wins. Because Apollo, I'm about to do a business deal. Let me do this little transaction. Help me get where I'm going, right? Or one of the most famous uh, gods in Thessalonica was Aphrodite, the goddess of love. She's the one found almost in every excavation in mass. And one of the most popular prayers to Aphrodite is, oh Lord, I have a simple request. A husband's loving heart is all I ask, right? And so the reality is there were all these gods. And basically the idea was it's transactional. I do this for you. You do this for me, right? I'm trying to manipulate things to get what I want. So it wasn't really about uh, morality. There wasn't a sense that these gods love me. That, that wasn't really a thing. And you didn't go to the gods to find morality. Uh, you went to ethics for that. Uh, you more paid them off like a mob boss, Right. I'm paying for protection from who? From you, but we don't get into the semantics, right? Like, I, I just want you to help me and leave me alone. And I need you to give me what I want. So there were social parties that worshiped a God. So if you wanted to get in with that social group, you worship that God, that's fine. Uh, if you wanted to get in good with Rome, everyone had to worship the Caesar. And so if you would offer offerings to him, you could get a political career. And so gods were moving around all through their culture and they were a big deal because you would come to the gods to get what you need. And, and you go, well, how does this work? Well, the verbs actually in this passage kind of help us understand why they were such a big deal. And you see it in, in verses nine and 10. They report concerning the kind of reception we had among you, how you turn to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. So the, those verbs help us because what you were, were doing two idols, now you're doing two gods. You served, you waited for them to deliver you. Serve means I play by your rules. What do you want? What do you want me to do? I got to do what you tell me to do. I got to follow your rules. I got to do what you say. I got to come to your people. I got to kneel at your altars. I got to do whatever your priests want me to do. I'm going to do what you do. And then I'm going to wait for you to give me what I want. And what I want is deliverance from, from whatever circumstance I find intolerable. Uh, so deliver me from lack of economic gain. Deliver me from poverty. Deliver me from uh, social rejection. Deliver me from political lack of influence. Deliver me from lack of love and romance. Whatever you needed a God to show up for, for you, you would serve that God. So wait on them to deliver you to the place you wanted to be, right? Those are the verbs. So it was never about a statue. It wasn't like, well, that is just a beautiful little statue. You are now my Lord, right? That, that's not what it was about. It, it was about um, every statue was a manifestation of the desires of the people. You want beauty? You go to the temple of Aphrodite, right? You hang with her crowd, Go to her dimple, reflect her values, sacrifice to her, play her rules so you can get what matters to you. I can be beautiful. You want victory in war? You don't go to Aphrodite. You go to Ares for that. Make me strong, make me courageous, make me brave, make me victorious. I will play by your rules. I will lift the weight you tell me to lift. I will eat the amount of protein you tell me to eat. But you make me successful. You want wisdom? You go to Athena. You want economic success? You go to Artemis. You want to be the life of the party? You go to Bacchus or Dionysus, which many of them did, but I can't describe anything they would do with those because the kids are with us today and we're so glad you're here. <laughs> but the interesting thing is, when, whenever Paul shows up in a society, he pits the worship of God against the idols. But, but notice it's interesting. There was a lot of gods and you could add a God easily. Uh, and so you could have just added another God or you could switch gods even. Like in those days, you could say like, you know, I was worshiping the temple of Aphrodite and you know, it's just not happening for me. So I'm going to Artemis, at least I can be wise. I'm going to Apollo, at least I can make a little money. You, know, you would kind of go to whatever God and people didn't care. He says, you turned from idols to the living God. He says, you exited that entire system and entered a new system. You vacated that whole way of playing by these rules to get what I want, to be where I want to be. You exited that and entered a whole new sphere. That's what was so crazy. And so when Paul would come to a city, it was always God against the idols. But what's interesting here is Paul will always bring up idols because what's really happening underneath them that we're seeing here is, is, is something about the human heart that, again, has way more to do uh, than, than just dealing with metal or wood. In the book of Romans, when Paul's going back to the very beginning of the human story, he starts talking about the way human beings uh, interact with God. And he says in Romans 1.21, although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him. 
But they came futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools, exchanging the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. Therefore, God gave them up in the lust of their heart to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves, because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who's blessed forever. Amen. Paul will say, the problem with with all of humanity is we were made by God and made to worship God, to glorify him and express gratitude, to see his beauty and celebrate it, to be enraptured by his love and to give that love right back. We were made for that. But in the human story, we said, rather than worship God that way, I want control. But as soon as you pull God out of the center of the human story, we have to orbit around something. Something has to give our life gravity or a sense of meaning or a sense of purpose. And so if you remove God, he says, God gave us over to the desires of our hearts. You go, how's that bad news? Give me over to what I want. Well, what did we instantly do? He says, we instantly started to worship things that look like man or animals or creeping things. If you remove God from the center of our life, we put something else there. We're made to worship. We're made to adore, to value, to see, and to search for value and significance. If it can't be God, it'll be something else. And if it's not him, it'll be something he made. So if I don't orbit my life around God, I will orbit my life around something that he made to give me significance, a sense of purpose, a sense of peace in the world. I will orbit around something. That's what an idol is, right? And so when you hear that, you go, wow, anything can be an idol. It's interesting, the prophet Ezekiel in the Old Testament said, you've built your idols in your heart. So it's not about stone out there. In your heart, you've decided something else is going to give me meaning, significance, value, purpose. Maybe it's a career. Maybe it's love. Maybe it's your religion even, or maybe, maybe it's your family. But whenever you turn a temporal thing into an ultimate thing, you took a good gift and made it a bad God. He says, and that's what they're doing. And, and the reality is when you hear that, you go, oh, Idolatry is not just a weird thing they did back then. We do it too. Uh, David Clarkson's a preacher from like the 1800s or something, and he talks about two kinds of idols. He called the open external ones. He said, where people out of religious respect bow or prostrate themselves before anything beside God. And he says, but there's also the secret internal ones. When the mind is most taken up with an object and the heart and affections most set upon, this is soul worship. And this is due only to God. When anything is more valued, more treasured, more loved, or our endeavors more for any other thing than God, that's soul worship, which is due only to God. So what is an idol? Uh, Martin Lloyd-Jones, the great doctor, said it this way. He says, an idol is anything in our lives that occupies the place that should be occupied by God alone. Anything that holds my life, my devotion, anything that's central to my life, anything that seems to be vital, anything that is essential to me on which I live and depend. I love this. He says, an idol is anything I worship, which means it holds a controlling position in my life. Uh, Tim Keller, who wrote a book about counterfeit gods, a wonderful book about this subject, really helpful in preparing this sermon. He said, anything in your life that's so central to your life, you can't have a meaningful life if you lose it. Idolatry is anything you look at and say, if I have that, I have meaning. If I lose that, I don't know if I want to live. It can be achievement, social standing, romance, competence and skill, physical beauty, your mortal record, your religiosity, your ministry success. All of these can be idols. It's interesting, in Ephesians 5.5, he says, greed, which is idolatry. He says, greed is idolatry. What does that mean? Well, he says, idolatry can be like obsession about obtaining a thing. You could not even have it and it'd be your idol. That you go, I want money and I don't have any of it, but, but the want of it orients my life. It decides what I care about, what I think about, what I pursue, what I chase, and what I ultimately think will give me significance and meaning, right? So you can make money your idol and you have it, or you can make money your idol and not have it at all. You can make power your idol and have it and try to keep it, or you can make power your idol and never have it. It's interesting, in, in Ezekiel and Daniel and some other prophets in the Old Testament, they, they told the people of God in the Old Testament, your treaties with Egypt and Assyria, they're idolatry. And you go, what's that about? It wasn't wrong to, to have trade deals with other countries. They were like, yeah, but, but you are not just trading with a company. You are looking for them to be your source 
of safety, of security to deliver you, to care for you. You are serving them and waiting on them to deliver you from what you fear. They said, you're taking this temporal thing and making it an ultimate thing. You're taking a good gift and making a bad God. It's moved into too central a place in your life. And we can do that with all kinds of stuff. We may not worship at the temple of Aphrodite, but how much money in America do we spend on beauty project products? It's staggering, is it not? We're just a little less honest than the Greeks, right? They just went ahead and built the idol and said, this is what I'm doing, right? Uh, for us, we go, no, I'm going to spend it all. I'm going to chase it all. I'm going to go for beauty. I feel significant to the degree that I'm noticed because of how I look. Uh, some of us, it's not really about how I look. It's about who notices me romantically. Um, Ernest Becker won a Pulitzer Prize for the book, The Denial of Death. And he was explaining how, how do you deal with a loss of belief in God? He said, if you're in a secular culture, how do you deal with the loss of belief in God? And he says, something has to take its place. And he says, one of the most popular things is what he calls apocalyptic romance. He says, speaking of the modern secular person, he wrote, he still needs to feel heroic to know his life matters in the scheme of things. He still has to merge himself with something higher, something with meaning, to trust him, to express gratitude. If he no longer has God, how will he do this? He says the love partner takes the position of God. One of the first ways that occurs to him is the romantic solution. The divine ideal will fulfill one's life, and he calls it the apocalyptic romance. He says, what are we looking for? Redemption, nothing less. You see that in a lot of our uh, fairy tales in Disney. What do I need more than anything? Love, right? And some of us reject that image given to our young daughters. Oh, all you need is a man. All you need is a Prince Charming. You don't need that idol. You get out of that temple. You get into the temple of Apollo and you get money and you chase that money, girl, and you get that job and you're like, whoa, 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 whoa. You just, you got her out of one temple and stuck her into another temple. Stop chasing that goddess, chase that god. Whoops. But am I looking to a thing to provide for me? Some of us, we go, you know what? Let's be honest and assess myself, uh, beauty and romance, probably not going to be the top priority for me. I don't know. A lot of people aren't chasing me. But you know what I can do? I can use my mind to generate money. And so I'm going to be rich. And you look out, world, because with my riches, I will have power over you. Right? And we chase that. Nietzsche wrote that in the absence of God growing in the Western culture, he said, what we'll replace God with is money. He wrote, what induces one man to use false weights? another to set his house on fire after having insured it for more than its value, while three-fourths of our upper class indulge in legalized fraud. What gives rise to this? It's not real want, for their existence is by no means precarious. But they're urged on day and night by a terrible impatience at seeing their wealth pile up so slowly, and by an equally terrible longing and love for these heaps of gold. What was once done for the love of God is now done for the love of money, for the love of that which at present affords us the highest feelings of power and a good conscience. And some of us can do that in religious spheres, that, that, that if we're honest, some of our religious performance it's not so much about really enjoying God and knowing him. It's about, oh, I'm gifted in some religious sphere and I'm going to use that gift to get your attention. Or, or I'm going to have some gift that, that people think is really valuable and I'll get people to respond to me because I'm talented in this certain way. Or I'll obey all these rules so I feel like I'm a more moral person than anybody else. Some of us, your gods can be the, the ideals of your parents, what your parents think of you. Some of you have never even asked the question, what does God want for my life? It doesn't matter. You already know what your parents do. You go, I got to do that, right? Some of us, the approval of our parents is idolatry. And so really anything can be idolatry. But if we're honest about it, for most of us, it's not really just these things like, oh, I love money. Oh, I love romance. Oh, I, it's what those things provide, right? Uh, Jesus said it. You can't serve both God and money. What did he mean by that? Well, you don't serve money by meeting money's needs. Money, are you okay? Can I get you anything? You want a glass of water? Are you good? How do you serve money? I position myself, I obey its rules so that it will deliver me from where I want to be. So there's not many people in here that honestly love money. There's maybe a few of you that are like, look at it. I love you, Benjamin, right? Ooh, look at the new watermarks they put in these here. A small handful. But you love money for what it gives you, right? It's like the money, the jerk, when they lost, or the movie, the jerk, when they lost all their money. Uh, and the woman began to cry, and she said, it's not the money I'll miss, it's all the stuff. 
I don't care about the money. I care about what it gives me. That's why some people want to earn a bunch of money and not spend any of it. You ever met people like that? The more money they get, the more miserly they are. Why? Because I just want it, why? To feel safe. So I got to have this big pile of money because it makes me feel safe. Whenever the world goes wrong and things go bad and someone's mean to me at work, I just pull up my 401k and go, there you are, baby. <laughs> you will set me free. You're going to get me out of here. You're going to get me away from these people. You are going to rescue me. So I will serve you and I wait on you to deliver me. Right? Some of you don't have that. And you go, I got to marry somebody that's an heir or an heiress or something. <laughs> that's what you're chasing, right? And you'll learn to love them, but you got to do it <laughs> so I can feel secure and safe. And what, what, what's the real God under the God is security, safety. Or others of us, we'll, we'll earn a bunch of money and we spend it right away as soon as we get it, right? On whatever the latest kicks are, whatever the latest suit is, whatever the latest whatever is. Because really, at the end of the day, it's not about saving money for security. Our God is really not money, it's approval. I've got to have the symbols of success that make you respect me. And so I will serve in the temple of approval. And I will do what it says, play by its rules, worship at its altars, obey its priests, and then I will wait for it to deliver me from the terrible fear of irrelevance. Right? And for many of us, we just got to acknowledge that. So how do you know? How do you know what your idols are? Uh, David Clark said this back in the day. He had 13. We won't do 13. We'll just do a handful. How do you discern what your idols are? He says, number one is esteem. What do you value most highly? Accomplishments, relations, enjoyments, honors. What are the things that you go, that matters? That when someone else has it in their life, you go, okay, I respect that, right? Some of you, someone says they have a million followers online and you're like, on what? No, let me stop you. I don't care. Others of you are like, how do you do it? What can I do? Will you repost me? All right, and that means so much. What do you value in your heart? Mindfulness. What do you think about most often? What comes to mind most naturally? In your unguarded thoughts, what rises to the surface? When you're sitting alone in the morning, what do you find yourself longing for? That you go, man, if I lived there, if I had that, if that person could just notice me, if that crowd would approve of me, if I had that job, if I sat at that desk, then... I feel safe, secure, complete, whole. What's the thing that gives, it gets the attention of your mind? What gets your intentions? What is the ultimate end of all your endeavors? What do you find yourself always making time for that I'm thinking about how to move there, how to accomplish that? I remember for me, I was a, a business major, uh, marketing and management in, in uh, college and, and realized about midway through it that I'm probably not going to be a business guy. Like I'd be the guy in the office being like, do you know Jesus? And make them all crazy. And, and, and I want people in the offices to tell me about Jesus. But I think if you're going to do that, you need to be good at your job so they'll respect you. And I thought, whatever job I do, if I'm bad at my job and talking about Jesus, Jesus probably loses in that arena. I think I'm in the right space. Anyway, I'm getting a little off the point, but... I joined this business group, uh, this program for people who were going to fast track into business school. It was pretty cool because they brought in tailors to tailor make us suits. They brought in etiquette teachers to give us the right etiquette. You put your name tag on the right side. So when you shake hands, they see your name. You're like, boom, that's my name. Yeah, you remember me, right? And they could see it. And uh, this is for rookies. This is for people in power. And uh, how to eat with your you know, spoon away from you. And, and then we go meeting with all these different like power brokers in, in New York and Washington, all these people that had power. And, and I remember sitting in that class and I was with like the most elite in the business school at my college. I was in there with the lions, with the sharks, with the tigers. Oh my, I'm like in there in that crew. And I remember at one point, I'm like, we're all friends. But they would bring some guys sometimes that were like multi, multi, multi millionaires. And for me, I thought listening to them was fascinating. I actually took on the job of organizing the speakers so I could spend time with them. I thought it was fascinating to hear their thoughts. But there were a couple guys with a lot of money or a lot of power. And I would watch some other people in the room and I was like, I remember thinking one time, I'm like, if that guy threw a knife on the floor and said, the first person to stab somebody becomes my intern. I said, I'm gonna get stabbed. <laughs> some of these people without even hesitation, there'd be a dog pile just waiting to shiv a guy because money and power mean so much to them, right? What do you resolve? What do you always have time for? What do you love? What do you cherish and value? Watch your compliments. What do you compliment? Trust. On what do you rely? What helps you feel secure? Fear. 
What are you terrified of losing? What are you terrified of offending? Some of you, you will rage against the failures of other parties, but if you see some hypocrisy in your own community, you will not call it out, because you know, as soon as you do, you might get cast out. And it's not even about the what, it's about the who. I need to be in this group. This is my idol, their acceptance, and I will do what they say. I will kneel at their altars, because I need to be in this crowd to have me, right? Desire, what do you dream about? If I could just get X, my life would be complete. Zeal, what do I defend if it's attacked? What do I protect? If I stood here and told you, Jesus wants to exercise authority over and then name something in your life, your money, your dating life, your romance, your bedroom. If I said that, what would be the thing that when I said it, you went, no, no, no one gets to decide but me. If I said, God wants to exert his authority over your financial life, your romantic life, your sex life. It, it, what's the thing that you would go, no? Well, you just found your idol. You just figure out what it is. Uh, it's like Bilbo Baggins with the ring. I can quit it anytime I want. I'm going to give it to Frodo. Why is it still in your pocket? Mm -hmm. Why shouldn't I keep it? And as soon as Gandalf starts to move towards it, what happens? He accuses him of injustice. You are trying to keep it for yourself, right? And Gandalf's got to get all big on him to tell him, I'm not trying to rob you. I'm trying to help you because good gifts make bad gods. This is a dangerous place to be. What's the thing that if you lost it, you wouldn't want to go on living? I watched this in 2008. I am safely in that 40 plus camp, folks. I'm not going to sneak into that meeting. I'm a card carrying member. I'll see you there. <laughs> But I remember in 08, texting some friends as the financial market crashed. I texted a friend whose whole career was, was building his firm. And, and uh, I, I called one and asked how he was doing. And he said, men in my office are devastated because everything they've worked for is gone. I had some other friends who had people they knew take their life. And then I texted one who I knew got devastated financially. I texted him, how are you? And he used this beautiful imagery. He said, the boat's beat up but the mast is strong because, because money was his career and he loves it and he was good at it and he's good at moving it, but it wasn't his king. I mean, it was a gift God gave him, the ability to move it and he'd been successful, but it wasn't his God. And so when he lost the money, he didn't lose him. There were other people when they lost that, they didn't want to live anymore. That's dangerous. That's a dangerous situation to be in. Pastor Louis Giglio says it this way, everyone's a worshiper. We've all worshiped today because we value something. That's what worship is. It's worth-ship. I see something as worthy, and I say it. And then this is the line. Follow the trail of time, energy, devotion, allegiance, affections, passion, and at the end of those trails is a throne, and somebody or something is on it, and that's what we're worshiping. This is what is of most value to me, and I will order my life in such a way to show you how much it's worth to me. So we all do it. And so some of you may feel a little attacked by the sermon. You're like, wow, I thought this was going to be an upbeat celebration of the church. It really is. What's crazy is the next week, the, the passage is where Paul's just telling him what he loves about him. And I'm like, ooh, did I time these right? Because next week's going to be like, you're such a great church and I love you so much. And this one, I'm like, let's all get together and talk about your idols. And I'm like, some of you are like, I feel attacked. I feel tricked. Right? <laughs> Let me tell you something. We're made to worship. So we all do this. Okay. You didn't know that. This is a support group. <laughs> Hi, everyone. My name is Ben Stewart. Right side, too much. Um, I'm an idolater, right? That's all this is. It's just us being honest. The human heart is an idol factory. That's what John Calvin said. Right? This is who we are. We all do this. The trick is just to admit it. And, and then when we do that, what we can see is, hey, God gave us good gifts. We can take some good things and do bad stuff with them. You can, you can take a good, a good date and make them your everything, and you will destroy that person and you. Uh, you'll take a good career and make it your source and you will make everyone around you crazy that we take good things and do bad things with them. Good gifts make bad gods. And, and the reality is we have to acknowledge that and see that and go, wait a minute, we got to turn from idols to the living and true God. That's the problem with idols is they're not living and they're not true. I never say his name right. Alexis de Tocqueville, someone correct me later. In the 1830s, in his famous observations about America, he said, a strange melancholy haunts the inhabitants in the midst of abundance. 
And his diagnosis was the incomplete joys of this world will never satisfy the human heart. He said, they're trying to take the incomplete joys of the world and fill a hole that only God can fill. That's the problem. Good gifts make bad gods. Idols are not living and they're not true. You put all your hopes in that boyfriend. I used to tell young college women this all the time. Uh, I would meet so many that they were like, if I can just meet a boy, then my life will be set, complete, safe, secure, lovely. And, And I would look at some of them and say, have you ever met a guy, (laughs) just like a man. Have you ever looked at one? I said, if you really look at one, I think you'd realize there's something wrong with this whole scenario. Like, do you really think he can fill every vacancy in your heart? That he can heal every insecurity, bind up every wound? Like, like he's clothed and that's a win. Seated and in his right mind, that's victory. Like that guy cannot satisfy all the resources of your heart. You can't know it. Now, that doesn't mean getting married's not good. That doesn't mean men aren't made in the image of God and wonderful. And there's a lot of fantastic men in this space. I'm not saying any of that, but I'm saying if you make it the ultimate, it will be crushing when it doesn't come through, right? You gotta be careful. Isaiah 44, 20 says, what you have in your right hand is a lie. He's talking about idolatry. He's like, I'm grabbing this thing saying, if I get it, it'll make me complete. And he says, that's not true. Jay-Z taught us that. <laughs> Go back and listen to Holy Grail as he's talking about the fame and the wealth and the money that he chased, he's saying, look at it. The bright lights are enticing. But look what they did to Tyson. All that money in one night, 30 mil for one fight. But as soon as that money blows, all the pigeons take flight, right? Then he says, forget the game for cheating on me. But what did I do? I took her back. And he's wrestling with, why do I keep doing this? I'm chasing fame and it's cheating on me. And Justin Timberlake amends him, right? And says, you take the clothes off my back and I let you. you. You pull the food right out of my mouth and I watch you eat it and I still don't know why. I love you so much. Kevin Hart, just recently, he's got a book out. He's talking about the dangers of fame and what he calls the cult. Listen to the words he uses, the cult of celebrity. He says, it's the biggest drug. It's not cocaine, it's not heroin, it's fame. Anything you want, everything you want. He says, and if you can't handle this thing, the consequences are severe. He said, do you know this? Do you know you? Are you okay with you? If you are not, it will break you. He says, the thing so many people are chasing to complete them, he says, if you're not in peace in here, It will not complete you. It will crush you. He said, it's a dangerous thing you're playing with. He calls it a monster. He said, that monster that you feed the engine of, he says, now that I'm making money, this is what I should have. This is how I should look. This is how I'm supposed to be. He says, that monster you're feeding, you're ultimately buying in, that monster will devour you. That's what Eminem and Rihanna warned us. I'm friends with the monster inside my head. That's what Eminem said, right? (laughs) That, That the gift he's given got him fame this is all that I ever wanted. And yet he looks at it and, and they're talking about it. And initially it's positive. Rihanna's saying, I'm friends with the monster, right? Uh, I get along with the voices inside my head. If you're trying to save me, save your breath, right? She says, don't do it. I'm happy with what I'm doing. I'm friends with this monster. But they can't sustain that even for three and a half minutes. <laughs> By the end, Eminem has to yell in frustration. I need an interventionist to save me from this monster because the thing that I love is killing me and I can't conquer it. He said, I got everything I wanted and it's given me nothing I wanted. Some of us, the grace of God will be that you will chase what you think will make you complete and he just won't let you have it because what you'll do with it will crush you. Others of you, the grace of God is he'll let you have it and you got everything you thought would make you complete and you're still empty, and it will terrify you, and you'll wonder if life is worth living. But it's in that place of terror where you go, these needs are deeper than an idol can satisfy. God says, so let me turn and show you a better way. Let me show you what you're made for. The incomplete joys of this world can never satisfy the human heart. They were not made to. So how do we get rid of the idols? If we've identified them, we all got them. How do you get away from them? John in 1 John ends his letter with, guard yourself against idols. I love that it's his last sentence in 1 John. You want to freak someone out this week, end the conversation with a warning. It's a disturbing thing to do. 
Hey, man, it was great talking to you. Yeah, let's talk next week. Yeah, okay, yeah, all right. Hey, don't go to sleep tonight. <laughs> Wait, what? What? I got to be meeting with the boss. Oh, that's great. Oh, it'll be good. Oh, man, that's exciting. Maybe you'll get a promotion. Yeah, okay, okay. All right, all right. I'll see you later. Yeah, don't look him in the eye. <laughs> what? Why? What will happen? What does it mean? And John ends his book, guard yourself against idols. That's weird because an idol's a piece of wood. Why do you got to guard yourself against it? Like, is it going to like topple off the post and start coming for you? And you're like, look at, hey, keep an eye on that thing. I don't trust it. No, he's saying guard yourself because we are made to orbit around something that gives me purpose and meaning in life. And, and denied food will gobble poison. You don't make God the center of your worship. Something else will slide into its place and you'll look at money or a person or a job. And here's the thing. It's easy to see the idols of other people. We know that, right? Some of us look around and go, those people obsessed with their social media accounts, ugh, right? But they look at us and go, their obsession with power, ugh. It's easy for us to look at people who are obsessed with fame and beauty in LA and go, LA gods, how ridiculous. It's harder to see the gods of power and influence here because we go, that's just how it is. That's how you get things done. It's hard to kick against an idol, but you have to because they'll take your life. They don't care about you. That, that's the problem with idols. Money will leave you. So if you go to money for security, money will fly away. Beauty will fade. So if you make it your source, it will leave you. Courtney Cox was in an interview with Bear Grylls. We watch a lot of Bear Grylls at the Stewart House. And it was surprising. Normally we're learning about how to survive in, 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 in literal jungles, but Courtney Cox is talking about the jungle of fame. And she says, man, I, I did things to my face and my body to try to keep up with beauty. And I realized after a while, it leaves you anyway. I went to its temple. I served it. I obeyed its rules and I waited on it. And it left me. The power is going to go. The health is going to go. Your physical body is going to fade. All of it will fade. Good gifts, bad gods. They can't deliver you. They're not living and they're not true. They're meant to be stewarded, not served. Your heart is made for something more, right? And so how do we do it? Let me just end here. The beautiful thing is, Paul doesn't say, so you just got to stop worshiping idols, man. You got to knock it off. Quit it. You love money? Stop doing that. You love romance? Quit it. Love something else. He doesn't do that because that doesn't work. Like when I put my kids to bed at night and they're worried about having nightmares, I don't go, well, what, what's the issue, buddy? Well, I'm worried about wolves. Well, stop thinking about wolves. Like, that is, little side note, not an effective strategy. <laughs> what you got to do is start talking about something else. Start talking about Batman, how freaking cool he is. We know thing about the other day is that you pill about what? Like you just start talking about some other thing. You start saying, let's, let, let's imagine an adventure. Sit, sit in bed and read a book and then imagine a story. Try to write a story in your own head. Try, try to do something creative. We start talking about, hey, maybe you can dream about this, read about this, think about this. And so you don't tell them, stop doing that. You tell them, do this. The way to dislodge is to replace. That's what Thomas Chalmers said. How do you dislodge a beautiful thing from the human heart? I love that. He said, if you got some beautiful thing, you're like, oh, Ben, but I love the power. I love the money. I love it. He said, how do you dislodge it? He says, the only way to dislodge it is to replace it with a more beautiful thing. And the Thessalonians said, man, we've been at all these idols, serving them, doing what they say to try to get you to love me, to try to get in the right circle, the right power, the right influence, the right money, so I'll feel secure, safe, loved, valued. And constantly they don't care and they don't come through. They're capricious and cruel. And at the end, we die and death takes all. And then Paul comes and says, Hey, all this longing for more is because you were made for more. The insufficiency in these idols is because you've taken good gifts and made them a bad God. But there is a God and you're made for him and your heart will be restless until it rests in him. And that God is living and that God is true. And that God loves you. That God sent his son to die for you and then raised him from the dead to deliver you from the wrath to come. When the grave comes, it takes everything from you. You lose in the end and your gods of money and power and sex won't save you. He says, but God raised his son from the dead. And the Thessalonians saw that and said, a God who loves me, a God who sacrificed, not a God who takes everything from me, but a God who gave for me, a God who loves me, a God who promises me a future because he cares. I'm going there. I'm doing that. I'm not chasing this stuff anymore. And that doesn't mean they all quit their jobs. He's going to tell them later, hey, get a job and work hard. But it means that, God, that job is not my God. I'm free. 
I'm free to love people. I'm free to live the life I'm meant to because I got God in the right place and I got his gifts in the right place. Guard yourself against idols. How? By turning to a more beautiful thing. Uh, I want to show a picture as we close. We got it. Oh, there it is. Anybody know who that is? Yeah, not Jesus. Surprising. Uh, you get that every time? Not Jesus. Uh, that, that's Brian Head Welch. He's the former lead guitarist for Korn. Again, kind of a 90s reference. But heavy metal band whose lyrics I will not quote. And uh, he wrote a book I, I read several years ago. And in the book, he was talking about how their band shot off into stardom. And he suddenly found himself with a lot of money and a lot of uh, attention from women, a lot, a lot of drugs, a lot of partying, just this whole life that for him, he had always dreamed of. And he said, the weirdest thing started happening is I was getting all I dreamed of, but, but the drugs that were fun were now requiring me to take more. And rather than them setting me free, they were starting to hold me down. Suddenly I had to get them, was scared if I lost them, I was terrified, and my life began to orbit around them. He said, and then it orbited around the money that bought me the things that I was used to getting. And he said, he was in his car one day and listening to a contemporary band, Nine Inch Nails. And they were singing about God money. Doesn't care about the poor. Doesn't care about the sick among the pure. And then in the bridge, they start to sing, bow down before the one you serve. You're gonna get what you deserve. And he said, that song terrified me. He said, because I am bowing at the, the temple of money and I have obeyed its rules. I've served it, I've waited on it to deliver me and it has not delivered me, it has held me down. So he emailed his realtor because his realtor seemed weirdly nice. <laughs> and he just told him, I, I'm not doing well. And his realtor said, I don't want to make this weird, but I was reading the scriptures the other day and I read this verse and I thought of you. And he quoted Jesus, quoted the text where Jesus said, come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. And he said, I heard that and I thought, I'm weary. I'm heavy laden. I can't rest. He said, so I emailed him back and just poured out to him that I have done all this and it has not saved me. It has not delivered me. It's left me empty. And he got a torrent of emails back from his realtor saying, God loves you. And God doesn't condemn you in your sin. He came to get you in it. He knows that you exchanged the truth for a lie. He knows you exchanged the immortal one for, for images. He knows you did all that. And knowing that, he came for you. He loves you. He ran into history for you. Jesus lived the perfect life you could not. Then he died the death you deserved. He took all the shame and guilt and punishment and destruction of it. And then he rose and said, there's a future beyond that. You don't need to be buried with the idols. You need to roll with me that I'm setting people free. I'm giving you hope and a future. You're riding with me now. And Thessalonians turned from idols to a living God. And they had joy even in the midst of affliction. And all of Macedonia is saying, what on earth is going on in that place? They have a freedom. They have a joy. They have a liberty that's unknown. The message is going, is it true? Is it real? Or is it just hype? Is it fake? And what they watched over and over again is a joy in these people's lives. And it says they met some affliction. They didn't understand it. And Brian Head Welch, when he put his faith in Jesus, quit the band. And I'll never forget, I checked the band's website and they said, Brian Head Welch is no longer our guitarist because he gave his life to Jesus Christ as a savior and Lord. And you could feel in it, they were a little upset about it. But Brian began to preach about it and talk about a God that would save even him, God that could set anyone free. That's a picture of him getting baptized, finding a joy he didn't think was possible. And he faced rejection for it for a while. There will be people in your circles that will not clap or celebrate when you tell them I'm going with Jesus. They'll go, really? Go with Jesus back to your desk and serve God money. You gotta now know what the Thessalonians had changed their social sphere, changed their Instagram feeds, changed the way they talked to people, changed the tone and tenor of their whole conversation. Brian had changed them. That's what the gospel's meant to do from the inside out. I'm serving him. I'm waiting on him because he will deliver me. I saw him do it. He'll do it again. So I'm going with him. And let me tell you something, where you may have some people not understand, where you may have some people push back, I promise you, if they see a consistency of life change in you, there are many Thessalonians out there looking for something real. They just need to see it in you. 
You may have to suffer like Frené mentioned. You may have to go through a dark valley that God will not pull you out of, but he'll bring you to the other side in due time. And he'll put a new song in your mouth, a song of praise to God. And when there's other people in the valley, you got a word of hope. You got a word of future. Because you say, hey, I was in that place and a lot of things weren't solving it, but I put my trust in him and I'm on the other side. Now you come with me. You can be not only a person with hope, but a source of hope. Not just a person with joy and a source of joy. And I've watched God do that in this city. I've watched God do this to this community. And let me tell you, by his grace, we are just getting started. The gospel strong enough to change Thessalonica, of all people, the Thessalonians. It can change Washington, D.C. There's no idol here too big. Not for him. I remember when I first moved to town, I, I met with a guy who had lived here for decades and said, tell me about the city. And he says, it's filled with people with father wounds, chasing success and power to fill that vacancy inside. And I went, dang, like, I thought you were gonna recommend some coffee shops or <laughs> lunch spots. But he said, this is a place trying to fill that hole with power and influence and it's never gonna satisfy. But if you're stable in the love of a holy God, he may give you power and, and you'll use it the way it's supposed to be as a public servant. Not use us to prop up you, but, but use your gifts to serve us, that's powerful. So I'm not telling you to quit your job. I'm just telling you to kick it off the altar and not make it God. Because it won't love you, it won't save you, and in the end it cannot bring life from the grave. But there is a God in heaven who made you to worship him. You'll be restless until you rest in him. And then the world just might marvel at the hope you found.